Hebrews 11, 4, and once again, if you did not bring a Bible, there's Bibles underneath the seats in front of you, and we'd love for you to take one of those out and follow along. Daniel gave the three verses that we looked at last week as building blocks to this single verse that we are looking at this morning. Once again, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. Now, let's be real here. Without prior explanation, the story of Cain and Abel is, is mysterious. It's kind of puzzling when you think about it. As a refresher, going back to Genesis chapter 4, if you want to hang out there, that's going to be wise for you to do that as well. So you can just flip to Genesis 4 and then Hebrews 11, 4, and that'll be a good way for, to remember that. But as a reminder, Adam and Eve, first two sons, Cain, who went into art, art, not architecture, that'd be interesting, <laughs> agriculture. Abel, shepherding. He was a shepherd. Animal farming, if you don't know what that is. But both were religious men, and when it came time to worship, each brought an offering that was appropriate to his profession. Abel from his flock, and Cain from his fields. And then the puzzling, mysterious part of it is that God favors Abel's sacrifice, rejects Cain's, and on the face of it, it doesn't seem what? Fair. Our favorite word in our culture. This doesn't seem fair. This doesn't seem right. God favors Abel's sacrifice, rejects Cain. Cain, in response, becomes angry. And God warns him in chapter 4 of Genesis, verse 7, If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Yeah, Cain, instead, he, he kind of nursed along his rage and, and then murders Abel, whose blood cries out to God from the ground. And the story ends in a tragic closure in verse 16. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. He just leaves the scene. It's a strange story from our perspective. What is, what is the reasoning behind the accepting of different gifts, the accepting of different sacrifices? Why would God arbitrarily, it seems, be okay with the animal sacrifice, but not okay with the grain sacrifice? Now, some of you will start going, well, I know enough of the Old Testament to know there's some things going on there. Well, be careful, because you also have to understand that along with animal sacrifices, there were other types of sacrifices that went along as well, including fruit, vegetables, grain. So what's going on here? I think very early on in church history, people understood it. Augustine, for example, understood it. In his work, City of God, he explains... Cain was the firstborn, and he belonged to the city of men. After him was born Abel, who belonged to the city of God. Well, once again, you're okay. What's up with that, Scott? We live in a city. One of the largest cities in the world. Why, what's the difference between the city of men and the city of God? Well, Augustine saw that each one of these men represented a radically different approach to faith. A radically different approach to religion, to God. There was the way of Cain, which 
if you've been in church at all, I'm not, I'm, I'm not leading up to a surprise here. The way of Cain is a way of unbelief, of, of self-righteousness, man-made religion. Jude 11 warns, woe to them, they have taken the way of Cain. In contrast was Abel, a way of faith described in the present text. So the theme of the first example here in, of faith and what faith is all about in Hebrews 11 is the contrast of two cities, the contrast of two streams, two ways of life, faith and unbelief. And some of you are still going, okay, let's be real here though, Cain gave a sacrifice, this doesn't all add up to what you're saying. Well, Abel's faith, as we will walk through this, produced and, and, and really characterized in his life three things that uh, are, are mentioned in this verse and is in your outline and is where we're going to land on this topic today to see what it means for our lives and and why would the author here tell the people in this church that are getting beat up by the culture they're in why would he use Abel as the number one guy to explain faith because when you think about it May I probably land on Abraham first? Uh, maybe Noah, maybe Joseph, all of which are mentioned. But Abel gets top billing. Why? Well, authentic worship, authentic righteousness, thus an authentic witness. Let's, let's look at worship first. And I think this is where it will make sense to us some of what's going on in this discourse that we, we see between Cain and, and God. The, the authentic nature of Abel's worship is attributed to the first sentence of this section of Scripture, by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. You see, this was approved because of obedience. This was approved because of obedience. To do a thing by faith, which is what this section of Scripture is about, by faith, we are to live for Him, by faith you must do it in response to and according to the Word of God. You hear God's word indicating his will, and by faith, you respond in obedience. It's what we talked about last week. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And from this, we must understand that God had evidently given very clear instructions to Cain and Abel, indicating that only animal sacrifices were acceptable. And this was very likely learned from and through Adam and Eve. Because in Genesis 3.21, after the first couple sin and fall, God provides garments. What type of garments does he provide? Animal garments. What would have to happen in order for God to provide animal garments to cover their nakedness? Blood sacrifice. Blood sacrifice, the first blood sacrifice was to cover literally Adam and Eve from their understanding that, oh no, now we have sinned. You see how this starts to work and how it puts together? So not only had God communicated his will regarding the necessity of animal sacrifices, but if we think about it, he communicated this first, obviously, to Adam and Eve. Then Cain and Abel would have been conforming to this practice probably by this point for some 100 years. It's generally considered that Cain was probably about 129 years old when this happened. 
In Genesis 4, 3, it says, In the course of time came brought an offering. And that course of time language there literally means at the end of days, indicating some sort of end of a specific period of time, very possibly a time God had designated for regular sacrifice. Therefore, we can surmise when we start piecing these things together that both Cain and Abel had known God's word regarding the necessity of animal sacrifice ever since they were kids and probably had obeyed that for years. And then you add to that the thought that Cain and Abel both understood the substitutionary understanding of the nature of the blood sacrifice, because when God provided the skins to clothe the parents, he established this principle that I was talking about of covering sin through the shedding of blood. Abel's faith was an expression of a conscious need for atonement then. Cain's wasn't. Cain's wasn't. He came his own way, the way of Cain. When it says that, that means that he disregarded Whatever God had put in place, and it says the way of Cain, it simply is he's refusing to bring the prescribed offering and instead presents a garden produce. He was saying that, you know what? And this does this sound familiar? You know what, God? My good works and my character should be enough. I'm going to go my way. You know, if God was really a loving God, he'd accept me for what I do and what I try to do. Because generally, I'm an okay guy. Does this sound familiar at all? That's exactly the way of Cain. The world today runs with the way of Cain as fast as possible. Don't tell me what to do, God. I'll do my own thing. And then you need to, because you're loving, you need to accept that because I'm just doing what I feel is best. There's a lot of I's involved in that. A lot of me's involved in that. You know, what I'm presenting is far more beautiful than a bloody animal. My work of service yeah, I'll, 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 I'll drill this right down because you see this in churches all over the place today. Not necessarily in churches, but this is, this is the mindset. And it goes like this. You know what? We're going to go build a well somewhere for people to drink water. But we're not going to share the gospel while doing that. We're just going to build a well because they need water. And then they leave. And then what they try to tell people is that that's acceptable. And it's like, you did a good work, but you didn't share the gospel. That's not acceptable. What was Jesus' command? Go into all the world and do what? Preach the gospel. Not go into all the world and build wells. Building wells is great in and of itself, but it's not the command. It can be a door that opens to something. But you see, this is how people mess things up with when they look at Scripture and they decide to go their own way with what's acceptable with God. And that's, that's one that happens within churches. You have all different types of stuff outside of that, right? So you just have to look at that. He probably came, I could imagine this. God, I would prefer the lovely fruits of the harvest any day over this bloody stuff. I worked hard for this and probably worked harder than from Abel. He just followed the sheep around. This is better market value. It's a bigger Offering, God, this animal sacrifice. 
a monument to pride, self-righteousness. Abel, on the other hand, believed and obeyed God. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. He brought, oddly enough, what God had asked. He simply just did what God asked, what God wanted. That is what made it acceptable. And so you go there, and it's very clear that it's acceptable through obedience. And then, why is that obedience even there? It's because the authentic worship has to do with it being approved by attitude. By attitude. Cain's attitude puts a stark perspective to Abel's attitude. Cain becomes what? Angry. His face is downcast, as it says in Genesis 4, 5. It, actually, what happened is, as God is sovereign, and God obviously knew what was going to happen here, right? The response from God produced the response that we would expect then from someone that was pretty shallow. His devotion was shallow. And when God actually pleaded with Cain to do what was right, warning him with powerful, symbolic language that sin was kind of crouching like a monster at his door and desiring to have him. God's plea was met with what? Silence. Difference here. Eve had talked about sin was talked into sin. Cain couldn't even be talked out of it. It actually seems like, and have you ever met anyone like this? It actually seems like Cain was determined to stay angry. He liked being mad. It was his motivational force. Now, there's a lot of guys in sports. One of the most famous was Michael Jordan, who always had to come up in his mind what guy on the other team absolutely hated his guts. And he would get mad at him, even though the guy had never said anything. And he used that as a way to, to act out in a more fierce manner as a competitor. Well, anger is an interesting thing. There is righteous anger, but that, that's a righteous anger has got some pretty strong guardrails to it. And I think a lot of times we want to feel like our righteous anger is righteous, even though it may not be righteous, because it makes us feel better that we had righteous anger. You know, Jesus had righteous anger with the people selling stuff in the temple courts, and we, we look at that and that we try to use that as our, our go-to of like, my anger right now is justified. And part of it's interesting, there's a quote that I saw this week. It said, anger can create and then reinforce a false sense of entitlement. A feeling of being better than others and deserving better things that can be used to justify immoral actions. Well, that's the way of Cain. That's the way of Cain. There was a famous author, for example, who was a specialist. I was reading about him this week. He was a specialist in anger. <laughs> I kind of think that's kind of interesting. What's your specialty? Anger. All right. And to him, anger was actually, it got to a point with him, anger was actually to him somewhat of an art form. He wrote in a play that he wrote about anger, he wrote this, I had on my table a scorpion in an empty beer glass. From time to time, the brute would get upset. Then I would throw a piece of ripe fruit into it on which it would cast itself in a rage and inject its poison into it, and then all was well again. That's... That's Cain and what he ends up doing. Cain drew strength from his rage. The release of his 
Venom was what soothed him. He would rather kill than turn to God's gentle pleadings and repent. So he directed his hatred for God somewhere. Like that piece of fruit, where did he direct his anger? Abel killed him. But Abel had come to God with a completely different spirit, this approved attitude of worship, a submissive, devoted heart. Genesis 4, 4, portions from some of the firstborn of his flock, his best. This was in accordance to God's word. God says later, one time, honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce in Proverbs 3, 9. God saw Abel's heart and was pleased with his motives. God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver, as it, Paul says in 2 Corinthians When I look at this, I am reminded that God desires devoted hearts in his worship, his worship being family. Jesus said this in John 4, the time has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. God longs for those who worship him with complete devotion. In fact, nowhere in the entire in the entirety of scripture do we read of God seeking anything else from a child of God except complete and total worship of him. God desires the sincere heart. Psalm 108, my heart is steadfast, O God, I will sing and make music with all my soul. When the, when the disciples harshly rebuke Mary for anointing Jesus' head and feet, he turns around and says, no, leave her alone. She has done a beautiful thing to me, devoted in spirit and truth. In this very significant, great chapter on faith, It, on purpose, obviously, by God, by the Holy Spirit's direction, begins with a worshiper. Because worship is fundamental to everything else we do in life. And we will see that with Abraham. Everywhere he went, what did he do? He built an altar. He knew that faith and service grew out of authentic worship. So the opening... The opening line of our text tells us that faith is essential. We've been saying that word for 17, 18 months now. What is essential? Well, faith is. Faith is essential to acceptable worship. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. It was faithful obedience to God's expressed will and word. Cain did it his way, but Abel did it God's way. Abel brought exactly what God wanted. Today, for example, if we would come to God with an acceptable sacrifice, as it says in Scripture, what would that be? Well, it cannot be our own works. It cannot be our own works. It's got to be sacrificial. It's got to be as Christ did for us. What did he do? He sacrificed everything. The way of Christ, not the way of Cain. And so you have this faithful obedience and you have this heartful Devoted attitude. Authentic worship. Authentic righteousness as well. By faith he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. Verse 
what, what does that mean? Well, just how God spoke well of Abel's offerings is not indicated. Now, if you go outside of the Bible, there are some things that are brought in from Jewish tradition and early Christian tradition with what happened to Abel's sacrifice. You guys know what that is? Early tradition says that fire came down from heaven and consumed Abel's sacrifice, but not Cain's. And of course, if you are a student of the Bible at all, you're going to start going, um, I, I don't, that's not there. And you're correct, that is not there. But scriptures do record fire descending on acceptable offerings in at least five other cases. And that's why you have such theological greats as, as Luther and, and John Owen believing that fire did indeed descend on Abel's offering. And it's very likely, especially at this ancient event, that that would happen. However it happened and whatever happened, what we do know is what? That God spoke well. And that on account of his faithful offerings, he was commended as a righteous man, a right living man. In fact, Jesus calls Abel in Matthew 23, 35, righteous Abel, authentic righteousness. John emphasized the life of love by contrasting Cain's actions with Abel's righteous actions in 1 John 3. So Abel rightly had a huge reputation for something, for righteous living. And, and here's the connection. Where there is authentic faith, which in turn authentically worships, and that worship is obediently bringing to God what he has asked in a joyful attitude. For example, we, we say this quite a bit around here, but what do we give in our lives? Well, we give, we give our life, but there are tangible things that we've been called to give sacrificially. We've been called to give our time and our, our talent and our, and our treasure that God has given us. The, the three T's that we talk about quite a bit. Our time, our talent, and our treasure. And this is the point where you sit there and you go, okay, treasure, for example. If you're walking by and, you know, oh, every week they, they talk about giving, offering to the church and all of that. And the attitude is, oh, here we go. I'll put something in, but this just is terrible. Here's your 10 bucks. Or here's your thousand bucks. But I still don't get it. That, that is where the joyful attitude is obviously ended. It, it's not about percentages. It, it's not about that. It's, it's not about equal gifts. It's equal sacrifice. It's, it's the sacrificial heart. It's the righteous joyful attitude and faith will produce if you are if you are really living by faith it will produce practical living authentic righteousness and james says essentially the same thing when he argues that faith and works are inseparable this week and I, I think of think of a bird for a moment I just want you to think of a majestic bird that importantly flies so do not think of an ostrich or a chicken so I want you to think of you know a soaring eagle for that matter there can be no flight with a single wing ask Siva Kind of does that for a living. There cannot be, with that bird, 
one wing going and the other not being used. It is the same for faith. Faith and works, they go together. They move together. An authentic faith produces an authentic life that flies high above the problems of this world. Like Abel of old. Authentic righteousness we see here. And then authentic witness. Let's look at verse 4 again. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And then the last part here. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. And by faith, he still speaks. One of the things that you can do, if you want to, and if I, I thought I it up on the screens today, but when I was looking at the resolution of the different painting, uh, the, there's a painting by William Blake. And I, I don't know if you're aware of that painting, but you can go look it up. And it, it, is, a, it is a powerful painting. And his painting depicts the murder of Abel. And it's one of those things, if you sit and look at it long enough, it's, it's horrifying. With all the different action going on in a painting. But in the foreground, you see Cain. And his, and his body is moving away as he sprints by and his, his middle section, his torso, is twisted back as he's kind of looking as an observer to what has happened at this point. And, and his eyes, if you look at the painting long enough, you will notice his eyes are, are wide in terror and his mouth is retched in agony and his hands are at his ears really in an attempt to not hear the wail of his brother's blood screaming from the ground. It's a horrific scene. And it's true. You see, in Genesis, we see Abel's blood crying for retribu retribution. This text, it's Abel's example of faith that calls us to a profound witness. He still speaks even though he is dead. He still speaks even though he is dead. What are some things that still speak even though they have long since been alive. We're in a room right now where we have a beautiful, beautiful ceiling of wood that is no longer alive. Right? No longer alive, but it speaks to us. It speaks to us in the, the grain, in the the knots, and, and you can just picture the type of tree it came from. Picture the cedar, for example. As one author said, the cedar is most useful when it's dead. It's most productive when its place in the ground is no more because there's no timber like it, firm in the grain and capable of the finest polish. The tooth of no insect will touch it, and time itself can hardly destroy it, diffusing a perpetual fragrance through the chambers from which it comes. The worm will not corrode the book which it protects, nor the moth corrupt the garment which it guards. 
almost immortal itself. It transfuses its qualities to the object around it. And then this author, I love what he says, every Christian is the same. Yes, every Christian is useful in his life, but the godly cedars are the most useful afterwards. Luther is dead, but the Reformation lives. Bunyan is dead, but his bright spirit still walks the earth in pilgrim's progress. Baxter is dead, but souls are quickened by the saints' rest. Eliot is dead, but the missionary spirit is young. And this is all brought forth by the story of Abel. Though none of his words, none of them, none of his words have been preserved, he has been eloquently preaching to us for thousands of years. And what about authentic faith? And what does he say to us? that true faith spawns authentic worship. That we will bring what is appropriate to the Lord. We will not dare to bring anything to God until we bring the blood of Christ that covers us. As one hymn says, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. this better sacrifice also because it was brought with a joyful heart. In Genesis 4.4, Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. It's like, "This this is the best of what I've got. And it's given to my Lord because he has called me to be like this and to give like this. And that's what the It's given with all his heart, and that's what God is looking for today with us. We see that Abel's life witnesses. Abel walked his talk. His authentic faith produced authentic worship, which then produced authentic righteousness. You know, I, I, I love our, our little worship team we have up here. Uh, and I, I don't, it's, it's, they're really good, and that's fun. But what I love is that they really worship. That, that's what I love. That they are being authentic. And that produces righteousness in our life. And then as we see here, Abel's life testifies that true faith's worship and then righteousness produce what God has called us to be for all generations. Authentic worship, authentic righteousness produces an authentic witness. And that is what makes it possible for us to go into all the world and preach and share the gospel, baptizing people in his name, teaching them everything that he commanded. That's what makes that possible. And by faith, he still speaks, even though he is dead. No one is going to give a rip about your house when you're dead. They'll sell it. No one is going to ponder for very long much about the car you owned. They'll sell it. No one is going to ponder very long how much you had in retirement savings that you can give to the rest of the family after you're gone. Although appreciate it, but it's not going to be remembered for very long. 
But we'll be, what will be remembered is authentic witness of who you are as a Christian. And at the end of your life, when you are with the Lord, when people speak of you, they don't speak of cars, they don't speak of stuff, they don't speak of your job, they speak of your character and who you were in Christ. And that is Abel, who still speaks to us today. And because of his faith, his influence spreads and continues to grow throughout the millennia until Christ returns. He teaches to generation after generation and generation incredible great lessons. The lessons of repentance, he understood that he needed to present a blood sacrifice. of gratitude. I'm so thankful for what God has done and of hope. A far-sighted reliance which for us gazes upon the cross. And that's where our spirit stays. We focus on the cross live for Christ, authentically worship Him, authentically give our lives to Him and live in Him in righteousness and be the witness that He creates in us to be. That is why Abel was number one, so that we get the groundwork right of what faith is all about. Because every single one of the guys and gals that come after this is built off of this understanding of what Abel was like. Okay? There's a reason he was first. It's built off of the understanding of what Abel was like. And then that explains why Enoch lived the way he did. Why Abraham did the things he did in response to God. Same with Noah. Go down the list. And that's why we start there. Let's bow our heads together and pray as we prepare our hearts for communion. Lord, we come